right, I believe this means we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions. Welcome to another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, aka Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this horribly named podcast. And uh, the QA, of course, stands for question and answer. So we like to make this an interactive conversation about all the top tech news stories. You know, really get our uh, get our feelers in place for all of the news that's been breaking over the last week. Maybe something popped up on our radars over the weekend. We definitely have some breaking news to talk about on this show. But I want to jump in as I always do. I hope you had a lovely weekend. Uh, I, I spent most of Sunday just kind of popped under the hood of my car. Uh, trying to fix a bad jump, <laughs> um, uh, where a neighbor was very helpful in trying to get a, one of our cars jumped, and unfortunately, we managed to fry uh, the the uh, uh, fuse that's connected to the battery. It was not my finest moment in double-checking jumper cables, something that you would normally take for granted and turned into an all-day fix just to get the right part and to get it disassembled and let me tell you, the fuses on these new economy vehicles, not great, not great to work with. But I felt very accomplished, like I was doing my adulting and that like I was able to fix something broken. So, uh, you know, while my back is a little stiff from kind of, you know, jamming hands down deep into the sides of my car for a couple hours, I, I feel like I did something worth worth celebrating. I fixed something and it was and 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 I'm proud of me. <laughs> so, we have a jam packed show. I'm already seeing a phenomenal live chat boing bite Mark Northgraves who just posted a great article, a great review of the Surface Duo on glowing rectangle, Suki Kyoto Pakostin uh, McCore Corin 3, Simon Says Hypno, Rue Sunshine, Matt Tyler, uh, Sam, also of Across the Pan uh, Pondcast with Sam and Matt, ER1980, Q3 Becker, Aditya Nil, Dave Burns, Root Knight. We've got we've got a we've got a show today. Saeed! Saeed. Saeed saying, you're a man now, son. Um, my dad would also be very proud of me. My dad was absolutely one of those guys who was never scared of the magic box so like my earliest memories of the family computer was like well we've got an 8088 and something isn't working right so i've just got to rip this cover off and start resoldering parts on this motherboard um same thing with cars like i don't know something's running kind of funky i guess i should just you know dump the engine out of this car and figure out how to fix it and it's not like he grew up as a mechanic it was just like oh it's a giant puzzle we'll put it back together i guess and that's kind of how i've always how I've always kind of approached problems. It's it's something I hope to share with my daughter, but it's also something concerning when all of our computers and gadgets and electronics and appliances are all glued shut. Like, I don't want her to be afraid of, well, you just rip the case off and you kind of see what's not working right. So I actually did get her to look under the engine while I was taking part, uh, taking things apart. But, um, you know, she's she's not yet five. So there wasn't like, having her hold the flashlight yet. We're, we're getting close, though. <laughs> um, Aditya Anil, Saeed is a legend. Dude gives us daily updates on the top voted posts on our glowing rectangles. I will happily second that. Um, Saeed on Twitter, uh, if you can give him a follow. I'll, throw him, I'll try to remember to throw him in the show notes. Um, yeah, he does daily recaps on our glowing rectangle so you can see what the top voted story was for that day so if you want to if you want to stay abreast of a creator community that's putting out cool tech videos uh he's taking it on himself i mean like i'm it, it's it's a, a wonderful addition to the glowing rectangles community to have folks out there sharing what the community is voting up uh and making more popular so um like I said, I hope you had a lovely weekend. Uh, hopefully you didn't have to fix a car or anything like that. You could just enjoy some downtime. Um, but uh, we've got a lot to jump into. I have a bit of housekeeping to cover. It's 9.07 in the a.m. And I'd really like to try and save my voice because I've got some podcasting and some uh, an interview 
um, for another larger tech publication that I'd kind of like to not have my voice absolutely failing on. So uh, let's jump in and uh, let's let's cover let's cover our news block as efficiently as I can, knowing that I like to ramble. Um, <laughs> get this out of the way here. Oh, Boing Bite! I upgraded my desktop for the weekend and got a deal on a used 3700X. Nice. Very nice. I'm I'm itchy. Like you know, when new AMD announcements start popping up, like I'm I'm still not maxing out my Threadripper, but maybe I need to upgrade my desktop. I don't need to upgrade my desktop. That would be silly. <laughs> I have so many other things to spend money on, so I probably shouldn't do that. So, uh, real quick, here's the week as it was. Uh, on somegadgetguy.com. Now, of course, all of the articles and news stories and links and videos that we're going to be talking about can be found in this week's show notes on somegadgetguy.com. But uh, I had a pretty busy week. So uh, Aditya Anil is saying housekeeping in seven minutes. He feels it's going to be light. Simon says Hypno says nine. Gary the Fireman has zero faith in me. He's putting uh, over under at 12 minutes and Boeing Bite saying 10 and a half. So here we are, 908. I'm going to try and cook this. So the uh, the video I put out that got the crankiest response from people watching any of my videos was, of course, my look at iOS 14. And the title of this video is iOS 14 is still a mess. Now, this was a very critical video to put out because you could instantly see who was the Apple stands that never watched the video, but felt like they needed to comment on a video title. If you go through the comments on this video, you will see numerous people going, oh yeah, here's an Android guy complaining about iOS, must be just doing it for the hits. I only mention Android and the literally the word Android once in that video. I am talking about iOS design. You don't need to make it an implied comparison between iOS and Android to talk about how poorly executed some of those ideas are. And if they're going to be drawing inspiration from other software developers, these ideas that we see in iOS 14 have been done better on other platforms. And I don't mention Android. So if that title bothers you and you feel you need to comment on the title, you should at least know what you're getting into if you're trying to make this an iOS versus Android thing because you're wrong. Just thought I'd point that out there for you. Moving right along. <laughs> this was my favorite video of the last week. I am a nerd for good audio and I love boutique audio brands. So this was uh, finally getting to cover the company Periodic Audio. So the title, In Earbuds with a Geeky Twist. And the I, I was really proud of the thumbnail for saying Audio Geek Boutique. This is a nice little kind of half rhyme, half alliterative quality to it. It's, it's, it's kind of nice. Um, Dave Bo9, one totally in the tank for Windows Mobile. I miss Windows Mobile even before uh, Windows Phone. But back to Periodic Audio, this is a... a crazy savvy brand that is doing one of my favorite things in uh, sort of boutique audio right now where it's not just the quality of the headphones. I mean, that's first and foremost. You want good audio quality. They are expensive products. I mean, so you, you do want to get that sense of I'm getting what I'm paying for. But like me audio, the company that I use their in-ear monitors and I have custom molds for their in-ear monitors, what I love are seeing those brands really finely categorize their products, not based on price, but based on capabilities and tuning so that consumers have a better idea of what it is that they're trying to shop for. Periodic Audio deserves a huge recommendation just because I find that their commentary on their products is very on point. And if you care about the color and the tuning and the clarity of your audio, that this is one of those companies you should keep an eye on. And following that up immediately, uh, one more color buds, some true wireless earbuds from one more that I completely sort of uh, miss uh, categorized. Like I got them in as a review and I thought they were just going to be a repaint of an older product. And even in the video, I get one of the specs wrong. 
Um, that's a fun game. Let's let's see uh, what spec did Juan get wrong on the uh, the one more color buds. So uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Uh, spoilers. It's I. It's a funny one for me to get wrong. And then lastly, I capped out the week with uh, a larger video. Um, I'm hoping to see the the series get a bit more traffic because they haven't really been picking up. But if you really want to know how a Surface Duo performs, uh, the By the Benchmarks video is out for the Surface Duo. No performance worries here. This video is not getting shared, like, at all. And it seems like YouTube has already decided that the Duo is a dead topic. So, again, I'm getting those notifications from YouTube like, oh, this video is not getting shared. This video is not getting viewed by uh, as many people. It's underperforming. Uh, maybe you should make another Samsung video. Those always perform way better. <laughs> so, um, again, it's it's kind of tough. It's the same problem that we ran into at Pocket Now, where, like, I'd put a ton of work into a camera review, and then it wouldn't perform as well. And you're like, well, yeah, it's a Motorola you're like, uh, well, maybe we should only do camera reviews for Samsung and Apple. Maybe that's what we should do. So if, if you feel that way, then I will only do videos about most popular products because that's all YouTube is going to put before people's noses. If folks aren't sharing stuff like this, which again, you know, we had all this commentary about the duo. Oh, it's an underperforming processor, which is bs <laughs> it's an old processor this thing is still like stomping on any mid-ranger phone especially some of these more expensive foldable mid-rangers um yeah there, there aren't any performance concerns here but if you want to see how it actually works real world it's worth digging into i mean how many reviews have you seen that have actually tried to tax a snapdragon 855 because i haven't seen many and yeah, no, off the top of my head, I mean, it's like I can I can point to dudes like TK who actually do some good performance testing. Um, if, if you want to see just a rundown on what this thing can really do, again, these videos die if they don't get shared. YouTube isn't going to do it for us. So uh, that's that's kind of a bummer because I was hoping that video would do a little bit better. And um, I do want to wrap up housekeeping now. I, I, I've already picked it up a couple times, but those of you who have maybe been checking out the Some Gadget Guy support page or maybe the Teespring or, you know, some of the links that get um, sort of uh, put up under my YouTube videos, I'm just uh, I'm just going to pick this up one more time because I'm drinking out of a slightly different coffee mug. <laughs> uh, this tastes so delicious. It's got like a really good analog flavor. It's like uh, it's like it's a better connection between me and my ve beverage. So I'm getting my beverage in higher fidelity and higher quality. Hold on, let me take let me take another sip. This is this is really good. Ah, yeah, no, you can really taste the uh, the immediacy and the articulation. And also, I mean, there's like zero lag between me and and sipping. On, on a on a mug of water here. Hold on. Ah, yeah, no, that's really good. Um, all all really terrible a ASMR and um, <laughs> this is this is the worst segment ever. Uh, last bit of housekeeping: the endangered species uh, logo for my 3.5 millimeter headphone jack shirt has finally been properly translated into mug form, and so you can grab that on my merch uh, you can hit the teespring link or some or it should hopefully be showing up under my youtube video soon but um i'm, I'm stoked it's uh it's the cur most courageous mug the courage of having a mug that ha uh, has a headphone jack on it so uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that <laughs> dtnl i have five cups one two personalized ones two merch ones and one generic one <laughs> i don't need one as of now so Aditya Anil is not down for any uh, any uh, uh, future some gadget guy merch. That's fine. That's fair. <laughs> so uh, and and I feel like I, I kind of agree with Sam here. You can never have too many coffee mugs. We like 
they're they're practical for a number of reasons but you know they do hot beverages they do cold beverages in a pinch they can be like you know like a little mini cereal delivery mechanism they're good for soup i just, i'm just gonna say it's good times but more than that it's like you know we've got the the mega pickles so the mega pickles logo is on one mug and now headphone jack save the jack uh, it's actually the reverse of the mug is save the jack so we've got that going on too. So uh, it, maybe if you don't want to wear your allegiance to the headphone jack because it's also on a t-shirt, um, then you can also show your support for the best cabled connector, non-licensed cable connector on the planet. So uh, that's housekeeping. I don't know. What do we hit? Nine minutes? Do we do it in nine? Boom. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, let's, uh, let's jump into some news. I want to cover the politics first because... I feel like we've been making a big deal out of these stories when we all kind of knew they wouldn't turn out to be the biggest stories. And uh, I'm, of course, talking about um, our current administration, our, our, our uh, President Trump, really trying to make a big deal out of an individual social media service. And then also it's a bit more concerning to see uh, – um, some some other chat and communications platforms sort of affected by this too. Uh, I want to jump into this first story from CNBC, and then I'm going to roll right into the Reuters on uh, WeChat. But we're looking at sort of a tacit agreement. Um, here, let me get this out of the way. Uh, CNBC written up by Jordan Novet, Spencer Kimball, and Alex Sherman. Trump agrees to TikTok deal with Oracle and Walmart, allowing apps U.S. operations to continue. And I'm just going to break down their bullet points. These are the key points from uh, from their article. I'd recommend reading their article. I'm going to be linking to it, and it's well linked with everything that's going to be going on. Um, and TikTok has an official press release out, and of course they shared it on Twitter. But the, the main points here, Trump said he has given his blessing to a deal in which Oracle and Walmart would partner with TikTok in the U.S. Oracle will become TikTok's cloud provider and a minority investor with a 12.5% stake. Walmart has tentatively agreed to purchase a 7.5% stake. TikTok's Chinese parent company ByteDance will own the remaining 80% of TikTok, according to a person familiar with the matter. And the U.S. Department of Commerce announced it would delay the prohibition U.S. transactions with TikTok until next Sunday. So it's um it's kind of a running theme with this uh, presidential administration and doing business with Chinese companies where big, tough talk, banning, and then they kick the can down the road over and over and over and over again. It's like the same kind of pattern or the same kind of strategy we saw with Huawei. Now, whatever our feelings are about Chinese corporations, the Chinese government, intellectual property rights, et cetera, et cetera, um, I, I mean, I feel like it's fair to have those kinds of concerns, just as I'm very critical of Facebook here in the United States. I feel we should be ext extremely critical of other uh, entities that traffic in user data. Um, but I, I have so little faith in our current administration to actually enact uh, any kind of reform or policy on internet stuff or telecommunications stuff or just gadgety stuff in general. And, and we saw that with Huawei. You know, again, it's this big bluster, this big, I'm going to do this, we're going to ban them, they're bad. But the ramifications of business as you work with multimedia and international corporations is really nuanced and a lot more complicated. And I think this also plays out with the other big story that's coming out um, that a judge had to get involved on this one, uh, coming by way of Reuters, written up by David Shepardson. U.S. judge halts Trump administration's order to remove WeChat from app stores. Uh, a U.S. judge early Sunday blocked the Trump administration from requiring Apple and Alphabet to remove Chinese-owned messaging app WeChat for downloads by late Sunday. U.S. magistrate judge... Laurel Beeler in San Francisco said in an order that WeChat users who filed a lawsuit have shown serious questions going to the merits of the First Amendment claim, the balance of hardships tips in the plaintiff's favor. So there's a, her 22-page order added the prohibitions 
uh, burden substantially more speech than is necessary to serve the government's significant interest in national security, especially given the lack of substitute channels for communication. And so there's there's definitely a concern. And again, Reuters has a pretty good write up on what's been going on back and forth. This isn't as as immediately huge uh, a community uh, again. You say ban TikTok and then TikTok kind of blows up and it has the Streisand effect where, oh, we're going to ban this social media app. And then people go, why? And then they go and check it out and then they become users and then it actually sort of explodes the popularity of that. I don't think WeChat is going to get a similar signal boost from this kind of policy, but it's one of the unfortunate realities of how we interact with other people around the world. Um like I, I had to sign up and use WeChat when I traveled to Shenzhen. If there are people who still keep in touch with families abroad, WeChat might be one of the only mainstream, easily accessible services for them to engage with. And it's not to say like WeChat good or WeChat bad. It's just that we've got an administration that tries to boil this down into the most reductively simplistic black, white, good, bad, evil, virtuous and the realities of how millions of people are affected by these decisions is far more nuanced and far, far more complicated than that. And so for me, that was the big takeaway. I, I don't know if anyone's got real strong feelings on TikTok in my live chat. It's not a social media service that I'm particularly interested in engaging with. We saw Triller pop up. Um, YouTube is starting its own competing short snippet service, which is hilarious because we've been seeing YouTube dabble in social media since Vine was really, really big and popular. Like, oh, what can we do to also replicate this business model? Um, Instagram, was it Reels? I mean, so so I don't feel like there's anything particularly special about TikTok. It just became its own little community. So people felt like, hey, this is our club. And then it blew up. But the actual business model of TikTok is eminently replicatable across the internet with every other established service that has any relationship with streaming video. The WeChat one for me did seem to be a little bit more concerning as regional restrictions on communication and speech make any type of distanced relationship more difficult. And you know, again, it was a bit of a culture shock the very first time I, I flew into Shenzhen and realizing like, oh, there are certain services that I can still use and other ones that I can't. And I'm I kind of have a VPN, but this firewall seems to be getting in the way of some things. And like the reality of it, like when you actually experience it for the first time it is 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 enlightening and kind of eye opening. And it's concerning, you know, it, there's the understanding of how all of that information might go through some type of review um, from outside entities. But at the other point is if you need to stay in contact with someone, that might be the only opportunity to do it. So, um, so yes, it's, um, it was just sort of an awkward week for this type of political story. I, I felt like a lot of noise was made and not really much of anything has changed or or will change from it. And I kind of feel like we're just kind of back into the same, same usership, the same situation that we were before we made all this noise. Ah. <laughs> uh. Dave Burns, too, the amount of data they collect, I find alarming. I think we all should. As Just as uh, I, I, I work as aggressively as I can to put Facebook into containers on, on Firefox, um, I, I think we should all. We should all be very concerned about the amount of data being trafficked by social media companies and how that data ends up in other institutions and government's hands. I, I mean, again, I'm not trying to say, you know, tick, it's all the same. I'm not one of those who believes like everything is equal parity of badness. Some things are probably worse than others, but you know, at its at the very very least, what we should be doing is trying to better educate consumers to wall off their their behavior and their data from corporations that use them as the fuel of their products. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, from Nam, I deleted Facebook and Instagram three weeks ago. It was hard for a start, but now I am okay not searching for my Facebook icon in my phone. My wife and I have been having some fairly serious conversations about what to do with certain family members, how to stay in touch with some of our friends. And increasingly, I, I mean, like, I, I have my Facebook completely on autopilot. I apologize if anyone, especially because I know this is also streaming on Facebook, if anyone on Facebook has tried to reach out to me, I don't check it. Uh, it, it, is, it is a constant source of stress. As soon as I open it to do anything, it is, I am immediately feeling heart rate increase and I have anxiety. <laughs> like, what am I going to see? Who's going to be starting a fight? What information is, is built to outrage me? And I'm, I'm always verified. I, I'm always validated in that anxiousness because that's immediately what Facebook tries to, to sort of engage me with is outrage porn, uh, political fights, uh, you know, a creation of the other with people that I disagree with, but I've been friends with. You know, it's it is toxic to the nth degree. And my wife relies on it pretty heavily for a collection of family members that she might not otherwise engage with. But she herself, she also goes through some significant anxiety every single time she has to engage with this platform. So uh, we don't have a great answer yet, but we're both really trying. I mean, it's like you're going out of your way to not use something that you're still technically a part of for all the for all the data that Mark Zuckerberg has on us. It's 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 kind of gross, um, but for, to the same token, it's it's like I, I get burnt out on on YouTube and YouTube's algorithm. Uh, Twitter is f sort of fine for just being a ticker, you know. Like I try and keep Twitter on just m most recent posts, and I can kind of see what's happening. And again, it's it's largely becoming a shouting place. Like I'm just screaming into the ether, but it, at least that's shorter form and less interactive in a way so I can kind of uh, ignore it better <laughs> but but really it's it's more like group texting and messaging platforms and discord and things like that that I think are going to be a healthier contribution to the future of uh, communication on the internet like you know discord I think is such a great example of I'm making a little pocket community this is a little circle and it's like it's it's highly regimented. It's, it's an invite only system. It, I'm making it for this, and I feel like for a lot of my family, getting them over that hump into using more of these messaging type services or like a Telegram or uh, some of these others, it just I, I think that's going to be healthier for everybody. So. <laughs> Matt Tyler, Facebook is best. You're just holding it wrong. Well, first of all, Matt, wrong you are. But um, it's uh, if you're if someone from Facebook has hijacked your account and is uh, is making you post things that you don't want to post, I, I took it out of the lineup. But it was going to be one of my other political stories that apparently there are organizations just paying uh, huge numbers of teenagers to post misinformation. And to repost bad data and to try and like influence young people's political votes. And again, it's like Facebook can't can't combat that. They can't fix it. They can't fight it. Their business model depends on it. And these kids are like, yeah, I'm making some money, but they're all making like less than minimum wage to work like, you know, crazy PR hours for people to hijack our election. And you're like, this is this is a, a I think it's an irredeemable platform. At this point, I don't know that you can realistically fix Facebook when the core thesis of Facebook is kind of broken. <laughs> McCorcoran 3. Facebook should just come with Valium. I agree. <laughs> um, and Brayden, my first bad experience with Facebook was when I was in the eighth grade and it was hacked. And I, I'm sure many people have had... Um, have have had some terrible experiences with these types of platforms. My tech review, I was talking with Jaime Rivera. Um, only reason we still have Facebook is for our family and friends that still attach to it. And at some point, we're going to have to have a reckoning. I mean, at some point, my wife and I are going to have to have a sit down and say, like, I care about you. I'm leaving Facebook. 
or I'm not going to be logging into Facebook with any kind of regularity, I here's my email. Text me. Uh, interact with me on these messaging platforms. Like there's so little value <laughs> in a world of Zoom calls and Teams and Google video streaming and FaceTime. I, again, it's Facebook provides so little value there. All right, moving right along. I, I, I just mentioned Google, and I feel like that's the transition point here where uh, Google's being a little bit snippy with, uh, with some of their services. Uh, who, who thought we'd see Google and Apple feuding on, on YouTube as a mobile platform coming by way of Engadget written up by John Fingus, iOS 14 picture in picture video stops working with YouTube's mobile website. And, uh, uh, it, it seems like Google is getting a bit more precious with what they offer as a premium feature for YouTube. And, uh, I don't know. How do we feel about this? Uh, hold on, let me, let me break this down. If you may have to wait a while if you want to use iOS 14's picture-in-picture -picture support to watch YouTube videos. Uh, Mac Rumors has noticed that YouTube's mobile website stopped supporting iOS 14's picture-in-picture -picture mode, at least for free users. If you try it, a video will only briefly pop out before it returns you to the web page. And uh, asking YouTube for comment, YouTube told Engadget that background playback is a premium feature. In other words, don't expect the functionality to return for free users on the mobile web or elsewhere. So YouTube is treated like this institution, right? It's like this pillar of social media and video sharing and production. I get that. But it's also a Google-owned service, and we seem perfectly fine with a number of companies, Apple included. You know, it's not like I have any recourse to use Apple products or services on an Android device, right? You know, like that's part of the iOS ecosystem. And uh, this, this, uh, there's a little bit of Schadenfreude. There's that little bit of uh, of now you see what it feels like. You know, with your tech privilege as an iOS user. Uh, this is what it felt like on Windows Phone, where Google did everything they could to not let their services run well on Windows Phones. Welcome to the club, Apple users. <laughs> Again, it's like I'm still bitter about Windows Phone. I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> Ah, from Braden, this is the case with Android and YouTube outside of the States. I need to pay for premium to get picture in picture. And uh, I got to say, I'll be curious to see how they handle it. But, you know, YouTube on dual screen. Huh? Now maybe people might be a bit more interested in like a, like a Surface Duo or an LG dual display. Um, it's, a, it's a bad look for, I think, a number of companies involved. It, I mean, it's a, I think it's a proper bad look for YouTube where you come out with a service, you try to support different features, you you bring people into using the platform for specific uh, for specific reasons. And then you're like, oh, but no, now you got to pay for this. And it's one of the things that's always bothered me about YouTube is I want a screen off audio mode and I don't want to have to pay for that. I, it's like I, I, I like being able to run YouTube in a browser and then move to a different tab and keep audio playback going. And it's just silly to hamstring some of those features when your paid strategy is still really scattered between YouTube Red and YouTube Music and YouTube Premium and, and YouTube TV being a different thing for television. And I... I feel like this is a good example of Google not focusing before they tried things and now trying to figure out what is the value and why would people charge or pay, excuse me, why would people pay for this kind of stuff? Um, from Dammit Adrian on Safari, you can go into desktop mode, YouTube, and then go home and then you will have it for free. I feel like it's okay to just say maybe YouTube isn't the thing. You know, again, if, if YouTube's business model is to encourage some type of paid subscription add-on for a functionality that is sort of core 
to the phone experience. I don't think it's silly that iPhones can't multitask, but sure, picture in picture, that's their solution. But that's kind of core to what iOS 14 is trying is trying to solve and uh, is trying to serve. And most video streaming platforms sort of appreciate what it is that they're trying to accomplish. So you do that. Maybe it's just time to stop using YouTube as much. You know, find creators or commentary or podcasts on other platforms, other services. You know, there's plenty of tech chat in podcast form. There's plenty of tech chat on services like Twitch, where we're mostly streaming this chat right now. It's fine to walk away. I mean, it really is. <laughs> I mean, like, the bulk of my audience is on YouTube, and I'm doing everything I possibly can to not play by the algorithm and to have some faith in an audience that will kind of join me on non-algorithmically focused conversations. And maybe that's what we what we got to do. Oh, and Tech Love and Mama says, hey, everyone say, hey, Tech Love and Mama. Uh, Saeed is saying he's a YouTube premium user, and he still can't get picture in picture to work on his iPad Pro. <laughs> um, it, it's, uh, like I said, I think this is clumsy. I think it's a bad look. It's, it's not great. Gary, the fireman, the amount of embedded ads and YouTube videos has gone up exponentially in the last month. I think we just saw the proper kickover used to be, uh, you couldn't bake in extra ads until you forced your video to be 10 minutes long. And now I believe the threshold is eight minutes and YouTube went and auto-populated ads in, uh, in your older videos. So especially if you were going back through and trying to watch older content, unless that content creator had specifically built in the ad breaks, YouTube has just thrown them all over the place. And that's the thing that bothers me is there's like a premium service that lets you stream and then there's ad revenue that's also kind of built on top of that. And I just... I think I think it's too many attempts at different forms or flavors of monetization, and I think they're squeezing an audience that's getting a little tired of how YouTube currently functions without providing more of a benefit to that audience or that community. <laughs> Matt Tyler, I'm still salty about dual screens in the UK. Got to pay premium to get picture in picture. <laughs> Um, <laughs> my tech review, uh, YouTube shorts is not working correctly and nobody even knows how it works. I've made a couple already and views are weird. Yeah. Uh, again, who is it? Tech alter also did something with just using the community tab to try and post like some short videos and stuff. And he eventually got to the point where he's like, it's not worth it. I'm just going to make a whole other channel. And that's what YouTube is, the algorithm is so busted for popularity. The only way for you to talk about anything that's not a super narrow focused main topic for your channel is to make another channel. That is so horrifically broken. And my channel suffers because I wanna talk about headphones and I wanna talk about tech politics. I wanna talk about recording gear and content creator gear and I wanna talk about phones. I like to be working in more laptop reviews. I'm trying to reach out to a couple companies, you know, maybe uh, try and spend some time with an LG Gram or something. I mean, it's like, I wanna broaden. I wanna talk about more, not hyper-focused to only talk about, you know, like Samsung and Apple smartphones. But that's what YouTube wants me to do. You know, like my iOS and my iPhone XS videos, much bigger numbers than Surface Duo and uh, some recent like, you know, just sort of tips and tricks videos, Google videos, Android videos, some of my pixel coverage. It's like instantly in that first opening watch, you talked about iOS. Let's share that. Everybody loves talking about Apple. And it's like YouTube puts that under uh, more people's noses, right? Because that's that's trendy and that's topical. But, you know, like it, it, we're going to talk about the Xperia 5 Mark II. That's a phone I'm way more excited to be talking about. I think Sony's strategy is on point right now. And they're making some beautiful plays for mobile gadgets. My coverage on that is not going to score as well. And, and again, it's like I... If that stuff doesn't share, at some point, this all becomes unsustainable and I leave the tech review commentary market in the way that it's currently set up. And I have to pivot. I have to figure out something else to do. 
Hey, Steve, just talk about Teslas. <laughs> and uh, Sentinel-909, I want that new Xperia. Um, yeah, we're going to be talking about that phone. That phone looks real nice. Um, my tech review, like Mr. Beast made another channel just for shorts, and with 13 videos, he already has 1.1 million plus subscribers already. But again, you can't, it's, it's not through any kind of meritocracy. It's that Mr. Beast already had a large channel, and so he's got a completely different relationship with YouTube than anyone in the smaller or more medium-sized space. If I reach out, I supposedly have a YouTube contact. If I reach out to them, they're like, hey, did you try watching the Creator Academy videos? You should, you'll get some great tips on like making better thumbnails. You should make wacky face thumbnails. Those are, those are so much fun. And then YouTube will like you better. That, that's all I'm going to get. That's, that's all I'm going to get. If Mr. Beast reaches out to someone at YouTube, he will have concierge service and the algorithm will immediately wait anything that he does because it's already tentpole popularity. So we're far removed from the old days. Like I, I did a time-lapse camera review. When I had like 20,000 subscribers, that time-lapse camera review got 60,000 hits. Now that I have 120,000 subscribers, a follow-up review on a brand new industrial uh, construction grade time-lapse camera that can sit out for two months on a single set of batteries, I'll be happy if that breaks 2,000 views by the end of the year. Again, it's, it's not through any kind of specific meritocracy. It is an algorithm that hyper-focuses on only the most popular uh, topics to talk about and heavily weights your channel against channels that perform better for a certain community. And outside that, you are burned. So yeah, anyway, uh, I stream on Twitch. <laughs> My podcast is on Twitch. <laughs> um, Saeed, I think you have to reach a million first, then you may think about broadening your focus. I, they can move the goalposts any number of times. It's, it's, I'm not going to make Sam Apple videos until I hit a million subscribers and then go, oh, but no, I'd also like to talk about a Motorola. No, that's, that's dumb. Um, I, I don't have any great insight on this next story, but it's worth bringing up. Um, it's going to be a sea change shift in a, in a community for gamers. Um, Microsoft to acquire ZeniMax Media and its game publisher Bethesda Softworks. So this is uh, directly from the Microsoft press release here. More than 3 billion people on the planet play games for fun, escape, and human connection. Unlike any other medium, games empower people to engage in creativity, strategic thinking, and teamwork, immersing them into interactive stories and worlds created by some of the world's most amazing creators. The cultural phenomenon of gaining of gaming, I was going to try and get through this without stumbling, has made it the largest and fastest growing form of entertainment in the world, an industry that is expected to be more than $200 billion in annual revenue in 2021. So, yeah, ZeniMax, um, hold on, let me get this down here. The planned acquisition includes publishing offices and development studios spanning the globe with over 2,300 employees, including Bethesda Softworks, Bethesda Game Studios, id Software, ZeniMax Online Studios, Arcane, Machine Games, Tango Gameworks, AlphaDog, and Roundhouse Studios. So we're talking Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Doom, Quake, Wolfenstein, and Dishonored, among others, including uh, smaller than AAA games. That is, that's that's a that's a pretty big coup. Um, I don't know how are we feeling about Bethesda recently. Uh, I kind of feel like Microsoft is looking at ways where they can kind of kind of latch into a few more potential like short term exclusives or. Like Sony's game is so ahead of the curve for locking down console se console selling exclusives. And you got like God of War and Spider Man on Sony on on Sony PlayStation gear. Like you can you can count on a certain number of consumers buying those consoles just for those titles. I kind of feel like Microsoft is trying to figure out ways where they can. It can kind of generate similar interest, have developers that are working sort of more closely under a Microsoft aesthetic, but then also be able to pivot this where, you know, we're talking like a Fallout style game, 
And it could go to a console, or it could go to a PC, or it could go to xCloud. And it starts to make that whole catalog feel a little richer, you know? And especially if that catalog can follow you to other computers and devices, that maybe that's, uh, that's, that's the gig, you know? Maybe that's where Microsoft makes more of a dent on software distribution and licensing as opposed to selling more boxes what live under your TV. <laughs> mm, uh, from Steve, Q3 Becker, Modder spent a million hours in total fixing Bethesda games, and now, now we own that work. Um, uh, Braden, they did say that they aren't going to change exclusivity for now. <laughs> But but it's it's not it's not like what happens today, you know, uh, uh, absorbing the entire collected talent at ZeniMax is kind of huge. Um, uh, Andrew Wallace, Fat Produce and I, we never got around to shooting a Geek Book Club episode on uh, History of the Future, which details the rise of Oculus um, and how Oculus then got bought by Facebook. And it kind of caps at the Facebook acquisition. And we kind of know now like what that looks like. And again, it's everything I can do to really try to not give Facebook any money or let them scan my house with a face computer. Um, but in there, there, was, there were several sections about how Oculus had a relationship with ZeniMax, what they were looking at for some kind of interaction with VR and uh, Quake or Doom style games. ZeniMax is this really interesting player with some odd collections of intellectual property that that could also benefit Microsoft outside of just game publishing. There are these weird little pockets, you know, like you wouldn't think of Valve and Steam and VR I mean, it, as, as like a direct thing, but then they come out with Index and it's this amazing VR headset. And ZeniMax has some stuff in there too that's also kind of wily. But again, it's today you, you start absorbing this company, putting them under the Microsoft umbrella, and then they report to Microsoft for what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And I really feel that Microsoft believes that the future is going to be sort of Netflix style game portability. Like it doesn't matter what screen you interact with, you can you can play a Microsoft game. You know, come just it's right there. It's a catalog. It's a subscription fee. It's accessible. You need to have data, but you need to have data to stream a movie. And the data requirements don't seem like they're going to be that much heavier if we start getting better compression. So it, it's uh, it's kind of interesting. It's it's kind of interesting to see what this could play out with if. Uh, Bethesda Studios is is sort of operating under more of a Microsoft idea. But then again, it's like, you know, are we going to see better mobile games? Or are they really just going to try and push xCloud? Um, <laughs> the last book. We've got a story about this coming up, too. If you look at all those titles, all of those are on Stadia streaming. I wonder how is that going to impact Google? There's a, an interesting follow-up to that because uh, it's... Uh, you know what? Let's, let's get through the next two stories because I want to come back to Stadia. Uh, you know, Microsoft makes big news this morning because um, this story broke this morning that they're acquiring ZeniMax. Um, let, let me just quickly point this out. Um, those of you out there, you were maybe shopping uh, PlayStation 5. That didn't work very well. Um, Sony did not do well with their PlayStation 5 pre-orders, and uh, they at least acknowledged as much. From the official PlayStation Twitter, let's be honest, PS5 pre-orders could have been a lot smoother. Smoother. We truly apologize for that. Over the next few days, we will release more PS5 consoles for pre-order. Retailers will share more details, and more PS5s will be available through the end of the year. Um, yeah, again, it... it, it the same thing kind of happened with NVIDIA. So, I mean, you can you can kind of like chuckle, oh, Sony and your wacky launch strategy. But if you were a PC gamer, it kind of the same thing happened with the the new NVIDIA graphics cards. Um, my, uh, my employer, uh, Newegg, not a great look how we were trying to get uh, G uh, RTX 3080s out the door and uh, how many uh, people struggled to get orders in appropriately and get their orders placed and fulfilled. 
So it's um, it's kind of funny, you know. Uh, we're we're looking at consumers really trying to drive these digital experiences and stay on the bleeding edge of tech. And you know, a console launch is a really big deal. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to see if PlayStation Five really will keep decent backwards compa compatibility for the titles that we've got on our PS4. And uh, that might make the difference for us if we go PS5 or Xbox. I think my wife is kind of sold on going PS5 for our next-gen console. Um, for our next next-gen console. Uh, but again, you know, like as a PC builder, it's like, oh, man. I, I was talking to some of the Newegg crew about what we might do for uh, 3080 and 3090 video. And you're like, yeah, that might be a bit sticky. <laughs> we we internally might have some issues. <laughs> so it was a it was a rough week for for gamers really wanting to get their hands on the newest, most expensive new shiny. Um, <laughs> Root Night Five. No surprise when you launch a new product with worldwide stock and the tens of thousands of units. <laughs> My favorite. There was a an image on a uh, Reddit. Um, Oh, I can't remember what the title was, but it was like NVIDIA shows off their entire global supply of RTX 3080s. And it's just the CEO of NVIDIA holding one 3080. <laughs> and it's like, oh, gamer salt like that. That makes me happy. I enjoy gamer salt. <laughs> Dave Burns, this is hilarious. I'm really looking at getting a 3090 just because I have a slightly better chance of getting one. I am going to spend twice as much just so I can hopefully get one of them. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. And so with all of this gaming hullabaloo, um, it was really cute. It was adorable. No, I mean, like, seriously, th this is, th this is like... The, the, the best, like, squeaky little voice from the back of the auditorium. Um, excuse me, I would also like to say that uh, if you would like to play some video games, that you could play them on Chromebooks. And uh, that was my impersonation of Google uh, topping up gaming on Chromebooks. They, they put out this, this um, uh, press release uh, early last week while all of the big, you know, PlayStation 5 and RTX 3080 stuff was going on. Um, but, but I thought it was this, this, beyond, beyond just making fun of, of Google here. It was interesting that they tagged this announcement, not just with Stadia. So leveling up gaming on Chromebooks. Here's what I found on the web. Ah, oh, no. Come on, Google. Apparently my Pixel 4 was just recording this whole show, waiting for me to put in a search queue. Okay. Uh, search, search term. A uh, new premium uh, premium gaming section is coming to Google Play. The Google Play Store on Chromebooks now has a premium gaming section that makes it easier for you to discover exciting games designed for Chromebook. These include favorites like Incredibox, Game Dev Tycoon, and Bridge Constructor Portal. But uh, instantly play your favorite games with Stadia and GeForce Now. This was actually a little bit interesting to see in a Chromebook PR um, blog post. Play your favorite games with Stadia and GeForce Now. So uh, playing high-quality video games on your Chromebook is now easier than ever. With Stadia, you can instantly stream and play games like PUBG, Destiny 2, and more on your Chromebook without waiting for installation, downloads, or updates. Chromebook users also get three months of Stadia Pro free, giving you access to more than 20 popular titles to play. Visit Chromebook.com slash perks. NVIDIA GeForce Now, which launched on Chromebooks last month, makes it easy to instantly play your favorite PC games across different game libraries, including Steam, Uplay Store, and more. Visit GeForceNow.com to subscribe to the service and enjoy favorites like Fortnite, Apex Legends, Counter-Strike, Dota 2, and more. I just thought that was kind of interesting. It's not like they're bringing up xCloud, so we're, we're not seeing that. This is different than Google's Google Play subscription, which has a bunch of games and those Android games could be installed on Chromebooks. They made the play to try and link Stadia Pro and GeForce Now as competing solutions on Chrome OS as a platform. 
I'm telling you, game streaming, Netflix style, is going to be one of the most brutally marketed alternative solutions to consoles over this console generation. And by the end of this console generation, I think we're going to see substantial traction on developers, um, licensors, uh, licensees, uh, distribution, really hammering these types of subscription services and getting them to work, again, with better compression. We're, we're talking about like the future of HEVC style video streaming, lower latency over slower data connections and trying to kickstart momentum in building out more broadband here in the United States. It starts to make a lot of sense. You've got premium consumers right now in a terrible economy. You know, even people who are still doing well, everyone's kind of taking a hit right now with what's going on in the world. If you live in an area where you've got decent data, you're already testing that on, you know, Zoom calls for school and work from home type strategies. You might still want to say, like, maybe I don't want to spend 500 on a on a new console, but I could start streaming some games instead. And I live in an area that's got decent data. Like, that's that's a good marketing tact to try and pull a few early adopters away from buying another expensive box to live under your TV. <laughs> Steve, Q3 Becker. It's interesting as AMD is powering Google Stadia. <laughs> Um, otaku all these games are literally the same though battle royale games you know, it's funny they're, they're mentioning the more popular games right so they're selling the service on like PUBG and apex like legends and fortnite um but the first game i played on a pixel 3a on stadia was uh attack on titan and it played great and the the wi-fi at newegg was pretty miserable and it, again it, it's like i had one minor lockup and then the game ran super super smooth and again, it's like I'm playing Attack on Titan on a Pixel 3a. That's awesome. Um, don't get me wrong. I love being able to play a game natively. Like I can play Doom 3 on a Microsoft Surface Duo. Great. That's awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, game streaming sort of democratizes a certain aspect of needing the biggest power what you can do in in the gadget and you just offload that work to a server surprisingly good <laughs> kyle ruggles i gotta say for having the xbox gold ultimate pass thingy <laughs> to be able to stream my games for basically for free it's pretty darn impressive it's awesome um the last woke is also saying you've got nba 2k12 and other games on stadia uh, Matt Tyler, but can it play Tetris? <laughs> um, Sentinel 909, I'm a PC Master Race guy, but I do remember and enjoy the time my time with the Sega Master Mega Drive 2. <laughs> Whatever gets me the turn on TV play game experience, sure. Um, and Pacoston, streaming games will collide at some point with the market. You will even uh, you will see even higher numbers of uh, P2P adware time waster game titles. Um, and my, Matt Tyler, I love I can play Xbox games on my phone. Having access anywhere is great. And I believe Ray Mondit shares a sentiment we can all agree with that Sega rocks. Um, the the console wars are just now being joined by Netflix style. Uh, game streaming, you know, X Cloud. I, I said it years ago, and I'm again. I feel like I'm getting validated a lot. You know, Apple validated how much I disliked iOS, and Microsoft is validating, you know, cataloging and streaming titles. X Cloud is an interesting beast. No one is suggesting that overnight, you know, consoles are going to die. You can't reduce the uh, effect to something so straw man. This is a very fluid and very complicated market, but we're already seeing game consoles lacking disk drives, which is another step into educating consumers that you don't 
You don't go to a store and buy shiny coasters to play games. Reinforcing a digital strategy for kind of keeping a catalog going. Steam has already kind of taken taken over. Steam and the Epic Game Store on, on PC. Good old games and Humble Bundle and all of these other retailers that also play ball too. But your catalog exists in some sort of server-based way. There, there's there's a reckoning. There's a market correction that's going to come over the next generation. And, and, I, and I mean that. It's going to take the next console generation, but we're going to see a pivot. For all the people that are, you know, kind of at the bleeding edge of, I want the absolute highest quality fidelity. I cannot entertain any notion of potential lag. Uh, the fanciest graphics and and lighting and shadow detail and ray tracing and all all of that. You're gonna have a box that lives on your desk with lots of pretty RGBs on it, and it's gonna be stupid powerful and stupid fast. There's a huge consumer base that is is gonna start dabbling with game streaming, and is mostly gonna be fine with a handful of compromises. And once we start getting things like DLSS style compression and um, image upscaling at the same time as we get more efficient video codec uh, um, compression for streaming out, those two together are going to put a serious hurt on the absolute highest quality fidelity. DLSS is insane. What it can do to jack your frame rates up super, super high with almost no perceivable loss in in image fidelity is incredible. Like it's one of the things that's keeping me from from really knee jerk jumping on a 3080 is my 2080 is probably going to get a big shot in the arm with better DLSS support in games. And I was fine playing <laughs> on DLSS. Like it looked really good. Um, so, uh, I, I really feel like this is going to be a great showdown over the next five to eight years watching market and consumer trends. I, I think there's this huge market that's going to kind of come around to gaming in other ways and appreciate the positives of moving games to different devices while also being able to live with some of the compromises like occasional slowdowns, lag, server side issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Goran Petrovic, do you really own the game you bought online? Is that mess solved? Absolutely not. Not even a little bit. Again, the the, the philosophical issues of, of a game streaming service or a game downloading service are very similar to buying a movie on, for, on your iPhone, and then if the license ever expires, then they pull the movie. You didn't really own the movie. You owned a license to watch that movie until that license expires. So same thing's going to happen with gaming. At some point, it's it's a guarantee. But again, we're all kind of living in this sort of future of how stuff works. All right, we should probably cover the sub. Let me take another drink of water. My voice is already getting kind of kind of fuzzy. Ah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, every. Every podcast has a subreddit. My podcast is no different. And uh, my subreddit, instead of being focused on me or in trying to find like popular news stories for, for every, uh, every week's episode, I'm really trying to build a community that helps embrace and share content creators' work. If you're in the tech space and you're trying to build the channel or you just feel like there's a, a reviewer or a writer or an editorialist or a video content creator that deserves more traffic, I hope you'll check out the community at reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Tiny little community, but it's growing every week. We are currently at 1,193 members. We've got a nice little jump, another like 25 or 30 people joined over the last week. And this is going to be one of the broadest and most diverse collection of articles and videos covering tech. 
Um, it, it, it does not hinge on the popularity of Apple and Samsung. And from there, you get an international community or an international perspective on how people are using gadgets and what their, their real world experiences are. So these are the top stories on reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. A number one with a bullet, Issa does tech. LG Wing, camera tour and unboxing, Swivel Phone FTW. Issa Does Tech is one of my favorite creators. She covers tech and lifestyle, and she covers it in style. And uh, she is, I, I think she's engaging and entertaining and witty and fun, and you should definitely give her a follow. Number two, number two. A phone no one wanted, a device the industry desperately needs, my review of the Surface Duo. And this is a, a text write-up. This isn't even an, a link or an article posted. Um, I believe this comes by way of Mark Northgraves just sharing his thoughts on using a Surface Duo. And uh, it's a great write-up. Again, just for this community. He's not even linking to another article or another video or something like that. He's just sharing his experiences using a dual display uh, duo. And I think he's got some interesting thoughts on the pros and cons of what Microsoft has accomplished. And number three, rounding out the top three, Surface Duo by the benchmarks. No performance worries here from some jerk in a hat with a punchable face. Uh, I've made it to the top three, Matt. How do you like them apples? Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> And Dave Burns, Mark's write-up was awesome. All right, so rounding out top five, you've got the Poco X3 NFC. A great look at this from Mr. H Tech. 396 subscribers. I really want you to think about that. The number four story on glowing rectangles voted up by the community of people that, that play on that platform comes from a channel with under 400 subscribers. Go through your YouTube feed. When was the last time YouTube really put a video under your nose, encouraged you to watch a content creator with less than a thousand subs? When you subscribe to a channel, I'm going to subscribe right now. I didn't even share this. I I, I don't know Mr. H Tech's work as well, but I, he just got a subscription from me for being on Glowing Rectangles. When you go to YouTube and you subscribe to a smaller channel like that, YouTube trips over itself. It cannot put larger channels under your nose fast enough. Click on someone with a thousand subscribers and they're like, oh, well, if you like tech, then you must want to follow Unbox Therapy and MKBHD and all these other channels with millions of subscribers. And you're like, YouTube, I went out of my way to try and find a smaller content creator. I'm looking for these types of conversations. Yeah, we know, so here's someone with 10 million subscribers. They do unboxings. You're like, no, that's not what I want, you YouTube, come on. Uh, number five, iOS 14 is still a mess from same punchable face guy. We've got a write-up. Um, no, this is a video from Johannes Sensei. I uh, shared it. Samsung uh, Samsung Galaxy Buds Live, an unboxing and review. Sony Xperia 5 II announced. My thoughts from Preston's thoughts. Mr. H Tech again, looking at the Galaxy Fold 2 5G. And then a painfully honest tech. The five iOS 14 features that will change your life. Bold claims from Old Man Jazz. Painfully honest tech. Jason. Uh, let's see, we also got Lover of Tech, looking at the Pixel 4a versus Realme. We've got For the Love of Tech, looking at the Z Fold 2. And Josh Vergara. Josh Vergara, just checking out a magnet cable, the Volta Spark Charger. And it's a little detachable breakaway magnetic charging cable. Oh, this is the one I wanted to bring up, Tech Odyssey, uh, interviewing the CEO of Onward Mobility, talking about the relaunch of BlackBerry phones in 2021. Like, look at this. A channel with 29,000 subscribers scored an interview with the CEO of the company that's going to bring back BlackBerry. That totally deserves some traction. And uh, this was one of my favorites because we are going to talk about some Apple news in the gadget block. Gary explains, taking a look at the Apple A14 versus the Snapdragon 875 versus the Exynos, just an initial analysis of the numbers that uh, that Apple put out about their next generation iPads and and A14s and all of that crazy stuff. So, already, 
look at that rundown. We got blackberries and real me's and surfaces and folds and uh, there's an Xperia L4, a magnet cable, Pixel 4a, Xperia 5 commentary, iOS commentary, some duo videos, and leading the charge is a savvy female producer talking about style getting her hands on the LG wing. Uh, again, I, I really want you to check out what YouTube is putting up under your nose and how that is not representative of the overall larger community of tech conversation. We are so hyper-focused on popularity, and especially from the major, major producers in the space, we've got to look around. The rest of the world is talking about other stuff, and techies are narrow-focused on, like, processor and brand. <laughs> Does it have an 865 and is it a, 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 a One UI phone? Rest of the world are talking about other things. <laughs> we are we are are in desperate need of broadening our horizons. So, um the last one woke. I know that everyone has released benchmarks regarding the Exynos, but I have a feeling it's still going to let people down. Potentially. Um again, it'll be curious to see. It's a very different The Gary explains video is worth watching. I'm not going to sum up Gary's video. You should watch Gary's video if you want to talk about the differences in processor architecture between an A14, uh, a Snapdragon 875, and whatever Samsung might be doing with the Exynos. Watch his video, especially from Gary Explains, because when you see explained in a video title, he actually covers topics worth explaining. <laughs> Aw, Dave Burns. It's because it's an Exynos. It'll always let people down. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. It, it, again, we grew by almost 30, 30 new members over the last week. This is a true, honest, grassroots, building up user by user, share by share, uh, submission by submission. We always need your upvotes. We always need your comments, getting more interaction and conversation uh, with different, uh, different content creators and, and helping to spread the word on content that deserves more attention. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. I hope you check it out because I think it's super cool. And I think a lot of people are now starting to, uh, to share in that sentiment that we could spread this out a bit more. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, uh, Kyoto, that wing looks interesting. I wanna get it, but I just got my V60 this year. I would recommend checking out uh, Issa's video. Um, I'm really anxious about Wing, and I'm a huge fan of V60. Actually, my SIM card is back in my V60 as I'm moving back and forth between a couple different phones. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're on V60, you're probably doing fine. But Wing is a really interesting uh, form factor departure and i think her video does a really good job of just like this is kind of what it's like taking it out of the box and it's pretty fresh so uh let's get into some hardware news um what i what i want to kind of dabble in real quick and i feel like this has kind of been sort of talked to death like i'm not going to have a ton to really add uh to apple's product announcement <clears throat> first of all um who else was kind of surprised um, that we didn't get any sort of qualifying or specific news about next-gen iPhones? Apple holds this big press conference in September. We're into the back-to-school season. I, I just got a notification from one uh, from Microsoft, from OneDrive. You know, seven years ago, you were at an AT&T store at 4 in the morning to play with new iPhones before launch, and it's me holding an iPhone 6, and you're like... Wow, I really miss. I re I mean, for as goofy as it was, you know, people camping out the night before to get their iPhones on launch day. I mean, that's always going to be a little goofy. But I really missed like I would do every uh, local news channel. Like I was on ABC, I was on NBC, I was on KTLA, I was on Fox. You know, they'd be like, "Oh, and here's a tech expert, and he can knock us through all the new things that are coming to the iPhone." And you're like, "Yeah, and it's got a camera." Um, I miss that. I miss that energy. I miss that fun. And only Apple was ever able of really generating that thanks to Apple stores. But, um, 
for 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 not mentioning an iPhone 12, you know, is is not even like a, a like a hard teaser to to make this in September focused on Apple Watch services. I mean, obviously there were a lot of services discussion, but Apple Watch and iPad, I just saw it was kind of an interesting shift. You know, it, it, it's even Apple seems to be pivoting on the most expensive flex devices don't hold as much sway when people, first of all, in this economy where people might be struggling to to pay those off on zero interest loans or leasing programs, but then also like, do you buy the most expensive flex phone when you're not really showing it off in public like you used to? Is it generating the kind of buzz or conversation like, oh, the new I oh, rose gold, show me the new iPhone. And people would like kind of dish about it and, and show it off. It's kind of like that season's new purse. You know, like there's something kind of fun about that. But in this current situation, we don't get that fun. So it's less desirable. It's just kind of interesting. The psychology on this is fascinating to me. So anyway, um, I did want to bring it up. Uh, here, let me get this out. Uh, excuse me. Man, uh, that, that this water, I mean, really, from, from this mug, you feel so much better connected to this to your beverage when you use a mug like this. Um, big fan of Apple Watch, so I liked what they had to show for services. Um, here, actually, let's pull up the Apple website. We can kind of just check out some of this right here. This is a, a smart strategy, um, which Apple Watch is right for you, and they've got different models. So you can check out the Apple Watch Series 6 at $400, the Apple Watch SE from $279, and the Apple Watch Series 3 from $199. What I think is kind of interesting is, you know, where Apple Watch SE slots into this um, because it doesn't have the always on retina display that the Series 5 and the Series 6 had. I'm feeling really good about sticking with my Series 4. I got Apple Watch Series 4 and and honestly, I kind of feel like it was a better overall buy than Apple Watch Series 5. The always-on mechanic that Apple uses on the Apple Watch really doesn't seem to improve battery life for an always-on display as much as Apple claims. Um, I, I think they kind of get the short end of the stick, but when I'm on an Android phone, I most often use a tick watch. Is it on? Yeah, it's on my charger. Um not, not because it's such a, a brilliantly powerful watch or it's like the, the bestest design. I mean, if I'm being honest, if I could get this kind of functionality in a Scoggin, I really like the look, just the bezel look of a Scoggin. But it's the this dual display tech. So I'm going to let this kind of kind of go back down. And it's that's not pretty. It looks like, you know, a kitchen timer or something like that. But it turn, completely turns off the color display for this little sort of a digital alarm clock readout, super low power. So I've hypermiled this watch for almost four days on a single charge. That's my best run. My average run is closer to three days and I have to charge it that night. Um, Apple Watch, the, the, the short test drive that I did with Apple Watch on an always on display could not get me anywhere near that. Um, but what I really like is their continued conversations on, um, on, on more health, health topics. It's not just fitness. Like, oh, we're going to track your steps and now you can check your pulse. Um, improving on you know, sort of the ECG capabilities of the watch is helpful. Now also including some support for blood oxygen. I mean, we're talking about people at, at, at sort of the extremes of the fitness conversation. You know, people who are are really trying to maximize workouts and other and people that might have some more serious health concerns. You know, this this wasn't really huge mind share for like the the bulk consumer, you know, where really a pedometer is is mostly what they're gonna get out of owning a smartwatch. Pushing to that is really exciting. I, I really do want to give Apple credit there because they're leading a conversation on health tech. And using their platform, I feel, in the best way possible to generate that conversation. 
And I don't think $400 is beyond the pale for a, a top of the line Apple Watch. What I what I do think is a little ishy um, about the Apple Watch SE is ECG. So my Series 4 so was the first to support ECG, um, electrocardiogram tracking. I kind of wish we had something slotting in between that also did that ECG. That, that to me is where Apple is kind of like, well, we're making this the bestest, most premium. And then there's like a steep drop off where this is like kind of a Series 3, but also kind of a Series 4, but it's in the shell of a Series 6. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's great. But, you know, shaving some cost, shaving $120 off of this, a Series 4 had this kind of support. So it would be nice if your middle expensive watch could include that kind of that kind of functionality. That that to me is is maybe the little bummer out of uh out of uh, this lineup. But overall, I'm I'm very I'm very impressed with what Apple has been able to do with Apple Watch. When they came out when Apple Watch first launched, I I mocked it ruthlessly. This shows you what you can do when you iterate and refine a product and don't just give up on it after a year. Google should learn something about that. <laughs> but yeah, what I'm really hoping is, you know, you see stuff like this and how Apple just, you know, dominates uh, the smartwatch market in terms of mindshare. It would be nice if, you know, some of these improvements we talked, you know, Google put out a, a blog post about updates coming to Android Wear. It'd be nice to see those materialize and improve the platform and, and grow an ecosystem again. But the mindshare is so difficult to reclaim. You know, if someone tried Android Wear way back in the day and it wasn't a great experience, they're not going to be inclined to come back. So you got to work 10 times harder to get people back. And that's more than just putting out a half-hearted blog post saying, oh, we're going to fix a bunch of things, guys. We promise. And no guarantee that your watch is going to get updated. <laughs> I mean, like, I, for as much as I'm going to, like, try and talk about the disparities between iOS and Android, I feel very much more confident on my Apple Watch getting better support than my Android Wear watch getting support. And, like, for everything I love about my Tick Watch, it's a bit more to do with the hardware that Mobvoi put into the Tick Watch, a little less to do with the software. Anyway, um, so yes, Apple Watch, very positive. If you own an iPhone, or if you're thinking about buying an iPhone, there is something so interesting about the idea of picking up an iPhone SE and an Apple Watch SE at just under $700 before tax than trying to buy a $700 iPhone. That, that completion of the Apple ecosystem is pretty savvy. I really like that combo. I'm rocking an Apple Watch Series 4 with my iPhone SE, and I'm so much happier with that than I was with my iPhone XS as just a standalone phone. And it would have saved me money if you were looking at shopping these different models and different price performance, value, bargain, whatever. Um, Real world, I take that iPhone SE out. I don't have to worry about whether I'm wearing a mask or not. Touch ID works great. Apple Watch is feeding me my notifications where I hate the notification experience on the iPhone. They complement each other better than you would expect $700 worth of gadget would, would enable. Um, let me get this out of the way here. Yeah, TK. I completely agree. Under $700 as a combo is a great deal. Uh, from Kyoto, my Tick Watch Pro LTE is on security patch June 2019. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. Again, I love showing off my Tick Watch. I love the battery life on my Tick Watch. My problem is Android Wear and Google really following up, really following through. And it, my Pixel just started listening to me again. So, yes. I'm, I'm, we're, we're, we're on the same page. Um, there was just a teaser announcement. I just got it in my email that apparently there's going to be a, a new tick watch coming out. So, uh, let me see. Yes. September 24, go beyond limits. Mark your calendar. T 
TicWatch Pro 3 GPS coming in three days. So uh, we might get some some new word. I, I wonder if Mobvoi is going to be jumping on the newest processor for uh, Android smartwatches. It could be kind of interesting. The other thing I wanted to bring up from Apple's uh, um, uh, Apple Showcase, uh, we got we got news on iPads, new iPad Air. Um, this is going to be the first uh, iPad uh, rocking uh, an A14. And uh, in true to form, you know, like uh, Apple's marketing, for as positive as as, a, as I just was on Apple Watch, it's it's this completely contextless um, comparison. Remember, you know, like Apple used to put out sort of an air of we are the premium solution because we are. And it wasn't about making unlabeled bar graphs against Samsung's and Qualcomm's and LG's and other competitors. They existed sort of solely as their own ecosystem, and they treated that conversation as if they were the king of that ecosystem. So I'm watching the Apple keynote, and, well, this new A14, oh no, they started with the A12. The A12 is is up to two times as powerful as the best-selling Windows laptop. What does that mean? Can anyone in my live chat explain to me what it means when they say an A12 performs twice as well as a top-selling Windows laptop? Those are words with zero context, no specifics. It's completely specious, feel-good marketing. And it's that kind of stuff that I get really excited when Apple does something like improves Apple Watch, and then they turn it right around, and you're like, our tablet is magic. And you're like, show me anything about how that relates to what someone might be able to get out of it. And they show me like, well, with our new neural engine, you can change the sky in Photoshop. Like, guys, that's not it. I mean, like, that is not an indication or any kind of comparative metric for how these things perform, but you put out a a PowerPoint slide. You didn't even use a bar graph. They didn't even use a bar graph this time. They just said twice as power, up to three times as powerful as um, as a top selling Android tablet. Which again, the best selling Android tablets, I believe it's probably more like four times as powerful. But by what metric? And how are they calculating this? And by saying top selling, something tells me it's not price to price. You know, a top-selling Android tablet is probably rocking mid-ranger hardware at best, and is probably like 150 bucks. <laughs> you know, like like an old busted LG that you get for free um, when you sign up for a new line of service on on your carrier, and they just sort of give it to you because like they got a bunch of them sitting on shelves, and they got to get rid of them. So um, it's it's not that that that. It, it's extremely frustrating to the point where it's kicking my stutter into place. Because now, if you're a real techie, you've got to work 10 times harder to untangle these completely uh, contextless um, performance claims. We have an entire industry devoted to breathlessly repeating everything that apple says so you're gonna see like oh and this new ipad is like twice as powerful as a windows laptop i don't even know where to start <laughs> yeah kyoto which windows laptop boang bite which device <laughs> aditya a12 is faster than a 250 dollar celeron chip powered laptop probably but if that's the case, why not say that, you know, like, or at least make it more price balanced. You know, if this, this, uh, new iPad is going to be like $400, what can you get in a $400 windows laptop? 
Totally fair comparison. Totally fair. I would be a, a bit more concerned about spending $400 on a laptop and getting a, a, a comparable performance with a decently specced out iPad. But anything, anything, any kind of conversation on that is beyond Apple marketing at this point because I don't believe these improvements are anywhere near as impressive as they're trying to make them sound. You know, I got to spoil a little bit of Gary Explains video. I really want you to go and watch his breakdown on the A14 and everything that Apple Marketing was putting out. So the A14 is going to go into this new iPad Air. Capacities at 64 and 256 gigabytes of storage. So Apple is still doing this nonsense where your starter storage for a premium priced nice tablet, 64 gigabytes. I just not, it's frustrating. But also some hope for the future at Apple that the button is a, is a uh, touch ID sensor. So touch ID is staying on the iPad Air in the power button. I really want that on an iPhone. I really don't understand why we can't have Touch ID and Face ID on the same product. <laughs> USB-C connector, there's gonna be support for Apple Pencil, I believe. But it's a 10.9 inch uh, tablet with the A14 Bionic. It's a chip with 64 bits and neural engine. It's gonna be a monster. It's gonna be 40% more powerful. Anyone? 40% more powerful than what? Anyone who was watching the iPad event, they said the new iPad Air is going to be 40% more powerful than what? I'm serious, in the chat, does anyone remember what they said it was gonna be 40% more powerful than? Dave Burns is saying more powerful than what? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? No one's speaking up. So Apple said, <laughs> uh, ER1980 absolutely nailed it. Apple said this is going to be a 40% performance improvement over the last generation iPad Air, which had an A12. So your metric isn't year to year. Your metric is two generations of chipset older. Now, if we were talking Android devices and Qualcomm came out and said, hey, new Snapdragon 875 is gonna be 50% more powerful than a Snapdragon 845 we would all rightfully go, wait, wait a minute. Why did you go back that far? What? I wanna know like year to year. If I have a phone with an 865, does it make any sense? Like, are you giving me enough of an improvement to go to an 875? And rationally, we all know the answer to that is no. <laughs> year to year, it is getting increasingly difficult to recommend just on processing power, a one-year upgrade. If you've actually handled a Surface Duo, you know that the 855 in that phone is plenty capable to do heavy lifting and laptop replacement work. Anyone out there knee-jerk whining about, it should have an 865, doesn't, they're bad at tech. You're bad at tech. You are bad at tech if you can look at the everything that the Surface Duo does and then go, oh, but it needs to have a better processor because you're not using <laughs> that compute power. I guarantee you, you're not. Um, it is exceedingly rare that I've run into other people that are taxing Snapdragon 845s, like really to a point where it's like, man, I gotta upgrade. This Snapdragon 845 isn't getting my work done. And the 855 is, is still a monster performer. So we've got these just completely vacant performance conversations like they don't mean anything apple saying it's 40 percent more powerful than the last generation ipad and you're like cool so you skipped a gen a14 what is that really going to bring us for performance improvements over an a13 if i wanted to maybe you know use one of their leasing programs to go from an iphone 11 pro to an iphone 12 
is that 10%? Is it a 10% bump? I don't think a 10% bump is really worth going through the hassle of swapping out phones these days. Again, because you're, you're probably not getting anywhere near close to maxing out an A13. So the A14 does what? What does it do for you? And, and again, I was like, I, I get where Apple's coming at, but this is going to be, what, what is the pricing on, on an iPad Air? An iPad Air with like no accessories is $600 for 64 gigs of storage. And if you go Wi-Fi, oh, let me let me actually go through all this. Uh, I'll pick green. Uh, let me go screen share so you guys can see what I'm doing. I'll go green. And <laughs> how much storage is right for you? 128 with the memory card slot? I don't know. Let's say 64 to keep it cheap. And a Wi-Fi plus cellular takes us up to $730. So I'll go Wi-Fi. Cool. 600 bucks. 600 bucks. Um, not to be fair, I, I like it, that's not terrible for an iPad, and I'm sure this is going to be a decently powerful uh, slate style portable computing product. But like, it really bothers me. There's this huge marketing and media literacy gap for techies. All of this, like, oh, we got to protect average consumers. Apple's really good at giving average consumers, like, what they need and, and not making them use gimmicks. The bulk of the market moved on, and they're not listening to techies. Techies are way off the pulse. <laughs> and again, it's because of stuff like this. It's because, like, it, it, it behooves you, and it's a financial incentive to keep up just the core talking points that techie fans of that brand are going to expect. You can't make an, an iPad video where you're like, well, yeah, the A14's like, I don't know, it's like a, a little bit of a bump. It's like 10% over the A13. Because in their brains, they saw an Apple keynote, it's 40% better. And so now it's like you need to be overwhelmingly excited for what Apple has done here because that's what their marketing said. And so you just kind of keep reinforcing the echo chamber and then your, your, your watch time goes up and your views go up and your ad metrics go up and your sponsorships get more lucrative. Why would you, why would you fight that? Why, why would you stand apart from that and say like, no, it's good. I don't know, 600 bucks, it's a tablet. It's 10% more powerful than like a phone. <laughs> Again, Let's say you have an iPhone 11, $700. And then you you want to, you know, you, you need another computer with an iPhone. An iPhone cannot exist on its own. So you think like, hey, maybe instead of getting a really expensive laptop, I'll try and do my work from an iPad. And that's another $600 for 64 gigabytes of storage. And you're like, cool. So now I'm at $1,300 should probably have some kind of Apple Care. You need to get accessories. If you want to use this as any kind of slate, I mean, let me tell you, first of all, I, I know I'm turning this into a rant and, and like a duo rant because, again, I feel like some companies get better treatment because of this popularity stuff and some companies are automatically losers because they're not going to do as well for ad metrics. But... It bothers me that a $600 tablet is purposely designed to force you to buy some kind of case. So, so I mean, like really looking at this, we've got this. Uh, let me go back so we can we can show you. It's got a great camera on it. I'm sure the, the the camera is great. What is this? Why do we have a camera bulge on this? We've had to make everything so thin, and now we've got this lump sticking out the back. Apple is going to be praised endlessly for how beautiful their design is. As soon as you put this ultra-thin tablet down on a table and you want to use your Apple Pencil, waka waka, waka waka, I got to tell you, for, for as annoying as the camera can be on the Surface Duo, when you look at some of the the prototypes 
that came before, like Project Andromeda, where Microsoft put like a big camera bulge on one side and then made a dent so that it could still fold all the way closed. This was the right play. I take my Surface Duo, I take my little Surface Pen, I put it flat down on a table and it's flat. And it doesn't bend or tilt or angle. You know, like I love my V60, but when I use dual screen flat on a table, guess what? One screen, whonk, off to the side. That's that's how it lays flat. And I and it has to be in a case because camera bulge. It's not like my V50, which was totally flat and would just live on a flat surface. So your $600 tablet to use it flat on a surface with some type of, of stylus or active pen support needs a cover <laughs> to make the surface even again. They have purposely designed a product that cannot realistically live without some kind of case to fix a basic design, I'm gonna call it a flaw, in having a camera bulge on a tablet. And you wanna complain about some of the specs or the spec sheet, this design is better. <laughs> the Duo design is more carefully considered for the type of functionality a Surface owner might appreciate on a product that expensive. I'm gonna I'm a breathe now. <laughs> Can we get a bar graph for the camera hump? <laughs> no, we didn't make it uniformly thick and use the extra chassis space for battery and maybe even a DAC with 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. <laughs> Dave Burns, I'm like 40% salt anymore. <laughs> so why don't we wrap this up? Um, I, I've gone on longer about the Apple announcement than I intended to. Uh, real quick, there's a OnePlus launch event. Uh, I'm just going to share the teaser, which is kind of gross. It looks like old internet, like this was made on Netscape. Uh, OnePlus 8T launch event, October 14, um, which their tagline is what? It's like Beyond Ultra or something like that. Ultra, uh, what is it? Ultra stops at nothing. Hold on. We're going to watch this kind of move one more time. Uh, come on, where is ultra stops at nothing? I, I don't know what that means. I'm, I'm actually really curious to see. I, I'm, I'm anxious to see what the OnePlus 8T can offer. Cause I'm hoping it's like flat front face, maybe get the camera improvements from the OnePlus 8 Pro, uh, 120 Hertz. Um, I'm hoping that we see uh, wireless charging, you know, if this can hit somewhere around like an $800 price point but blur all of the specs between the two. I'd really like to see OnePlus stop doing um, a OnePlus, uh, like a OnePlus 8, a OnePlus 8 Pro, a OnePlus 8T, a OnePlus 8T Pro. Now we've got the Nord. There's probably gonna be some other lower end phone that's gonna hit the United States. I think it's too many. I would really love them to get to one premium option and one less expensive or mid-ranger option in every market. And 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 these, you know, bi-yearly refreshes, is that bi-yearly? Or like every six months, you know, they have to like refresh the phone. I'd kind of like them to just put out one phone. <laughs> um, if you can focus on just making the OnePlus 8T at the beginning of the year, I feel like that's better for consumers in the long run. It's not as exciting it doesn't give them as many things to talk about, but for as much as I've loved using that OnePlus 8 Pro and the camera on the OnePlus 8 Pro is startlingly good. Um, I mean, again, comparatively, there are still some OnePlus 8, there, there are still, there is still some OnePlus 8 jank, but that camera sensor, the 48 megapixel camera sensor in the OnePlus 8 Pro is stunning hardware. Um, I, I kind of would have preferred having just one premium OnePlus and one sort of more budget focused OnePlus. So we'll see. But the the uh, moving on and um, and we'll get more information. Uh, again, it's coming in a couple weeks. We, October fourteenth. It's not too far away. We're gonna get what is that? Three weeks from now? Uh, uh, almost four. We're gonna see some. 
some some bold claims being made by OnePlus. So I'll be curious to see what else they might do. Like if it's uh, an 865 plus, if it's wireless charging. I, I, I f I'm feeling pretty confident on a 120 hertz display as opposed to a 90 hertz display. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, ER 1980 with the Huawei band globally, Xiaomi, Oppo, Vivo, OnePlus, Motorola are flooding the market to replace the drop in Huawei market share. It's, um, yeah, it's pretty heavy. And, and Dave Burns makes a great point. When they have the Oppo parts bin at their disposal, I guess they're just throwing stuff at the wall. I don't think they're, I, I don't think it's that slapdash. You know, again, as a division of Oppo, because they kind of have moved operations more properly under uh, Oppo proper as being sort of a BBK brand. Yeah, BBK. Um, I, I don't see like this is sloppy. It's just, I'd kind of like them to get back to a slightly more focused approach, but I have that kind of complaint with most manufacturers, you know, like Samsung included. It's like, I don't want fan editions and multiple size variants and 5G this and 4G that and price here and this chipset for this carrier. It's it's rough. It's very confusing to consumers and the simplicity of OnePlus being focused on a single phone as the single brand. I personally liked better, but a brand's got to grow and they've got to evolve. And so now they're going to become more of a mainstream offering. So it's, it's interesting. But yeah, so if we got 1080p with 120 hertz, the larger 48 megapixel camera sensor, uh, the, the fast wireless charging, hopefully an IP rating, maybe this is IP68. If you could just sort of move bits and pieces back and forth, I don't see any reason to force another pro. And the 8T could be the monster performer. Could be kind of cool. So, um... <laughs> Kyle Ruggles, is OnePlus even focused on speed anymore? They're no longer the fastest, right? Um, I don't know that OnePlus has ever been truly the fastest. Uh, I have a series of videos called By the Benchmarks, and maybe we'll talk about OnePlus uh, benchmarking in real world conditions. Could be interesting. We'll have to see. <laughs> but I really want to get to wrapping the show up. Uh, Sony put out an announcement. Oh, I've got to say, um, <laughs> Aditya, the fastest? You mean Apple. <laughs> uh, I, I got to show this. This isn't going to be as exciting. Um, I'm excited because I've finally been reunited with the Xperia 1 Mark II. I was kind of left in the lurch at the beginning of the year, and there are some things that I need to finish. Finally going to get to wrapping up a an Xperia 1 camera review now that I can shoot native RAW um, from the Xperia camera apps. I'm just so happy to have this phone back in hand to talk about, a, I mean, like a baller pro-grade camera focused headphone jack sporting premium option but that's leading me into i think one of the bigger announcements and i think people sleep on on sony as a manufacturer but everything i see on the xperia 5 mark ii is making me real happy for the direction sony is taking their smartphone business um <laughs> simon says hypno reunited and feel so good i i really like what sony's doing i really like this play um there are a few things here i really hope make it to the xperia one um getting to see like they've got a special camera mode now that over cranks 4k video at 120 frames per second. It doesn't save 4k 120, but it can drive 4k 120 and then it saves it at any frame rate you want. So if you want it half speed at 60 frames per second, if you want it one fifth speed at 24 frames per second, that's kind of nuts. And it's, a big improvement to some of the slow motion, you know, like you got that 960 frame per second burst slow-mo. 4K 120, I feel, will be more usable 
um, higher quality footage and more exciting for someone who might really want to try and make something with a phone. But following up, uh, you know, where we were on the Xperia 5 last year, it's a very similar size reduction. So uh, we're, we're moving down from the UHD resolution screen to 1080p. It is getting 120 hertz. So for those of you who are can only survive having the absolute fastest frame rate on a phone, Sony's going to be catching up there. Um, we're getting mostly the same camera modules, just lacking... I, I believe it's like the 3D depth. Like it's the little side sensor. I don't think I'll be able to show it here. It's... It's like there's a teeny little side sensor on the Xperia 1. So that's not going to be on the Xperia 5. But um, the, the, the astoundingly good autofocus, eye tracking. Eye tracking is coming to pets. Um, again, I love this Zeiss optics. The, the Sony optics are great. You know, like the glass that they put on their, their phone cameras is great. It's just funny. You know, like Zeiss. But these strategic partnerships matter. And again, Zeiss is probably looking at like, hey, how do we um, how do we branch out a bit? You know, uh, we don't want to be just, you know, stuck on one phone and becoming more of a phone solution means they're probably making a lot more money. Uh, screen for movies, there's going to be a gaming, a particular gaming focus. They're still keeping the matched, the better matched stereo speakers. Again, you're, you're winning me over when you say headphone jack. Absolutely love that it has a headphone jack. Um, and then it's got like Insta pairing with um, uh, a PlayStation, uh, a PlayStation Four DualShock controller. This stuff is all like, I, it, it's very difficult. Oh, here it is. Take control, and you can connect your DualShock Four. I need to get one of these mounts. I need to see how how it actually fits in one of these mounts. But it's little things like when they show this. I love Sony's new design. So you got this bracket, right? You put your phone in sideways. And all of your buttons on a Sony are on one side. But if I scroll back up here, where is the photo? I want to find. Oh, they're not showing the other side. I saw another photo where it's like their buttons are kind of flush. Oh, right here. So the volume rocker sticks out, but the power button actually kind of scoops in a little. And it looks like there's going to be another, like this is a, another button right here. It might be like a, a pair button or, I mean, a, a customized extra switch in addition to the camera button. But it's real close. So because your power button doesn't stick out, it makes it so much easier to put a phone into a cradle. Let me scroll back up. Where was? Oh, I, I'm, I'm all over the place right here. It makes it so much easier to put your phone in a mount when you don't have buttons that are getting pressed opposite you know, sides of your phone. So those kinds of considerations, it's one of the things that I've really enjoyed on the Xperia 1 is uh, you can kind of see it really clearly on this case, this right here, open space. It's very easy to get a mount. Here's my jobby. Mount just kind of pops right on there. Phone is beautifully cradled. I have access to the camera button. I have access to the power button. I don't have anything on the bottom edge that's going to interact if I want to get a ground level shot. It's like a real camera in a phone. That design is so refreshing. I don't like having buttons on multiple sides of the phone, especially like I do a ground level shot. Um, I took a picture of a praying mantis and I had my V60 and I, I rest the, the V60 on the ground and it fires off a burst because I click in the volume rocker. And you're like, that's kind of dumb. <laughs> and I'm totally spoiled by using a Sony where I put this phone down flat and it's just flat. And it's like, oh, and now I can just take a photo because the button's up here. It just works. <laughs> so, um... I'm very much looking forward. How are people feeling Xperia 5? I feel like this is a, a, it's a premium option. I am not expecting Xperia 1 and Xperia 5 Mark IIs to suddenly start blowing up sales records or anything like that. But Sony's pivot, gaming and content creation. It's everything I love about V-series LG phones. 
I like gaming on a V60 because I can use dual display and have kind of a customized controller. And I love having a, a headphone jack that's good for plugging in microphones so that I can record audio um, directly into my video, my video tracks. I am very positive on the move Sony's made because it seems like Sony really has put Xperia more under the purview of the Alpha team. So Sony Alpha cameras dictating what the Xperia's are going to focus on, I think delivers a particular focus that makes the phone a lot more interesting to talk about. <laughs> From Vazicos 8, the 5 Mark II has a Google button there, though. What, what I think will be interesting to see is whether or not that button really sticks out, because I've seen a few product photos where it looks flush. And a few where it looks like it's a, a, a big pop-out button. So we'll have to see if it's more like the sort of side experience that we have on the Xperia 1. I think it's going to play well. <clears throat> um, Saeed, did you ever do an audio test on that Xperia? I believe I did. Hold on. Let me go to uh, some audio guy dot, I mean, some gadget guy dot com. Let's go to audio reviews. And then my master list is right there. Uh, 2020 Sony Xperia 1 Mark II, the jack is back. So yes, I did do an audio review on the Xperia 1 Mark II. There you go, Ted. Saeed, you can go check it out. Um, TrendNet 18 Xperia 5 Mark II seems interesting. Concerned about the camera due to the front camera and auto mode is kind of weak. And that's what reviewers are saying. I will politely disagree. Um, I took the Xperia 1 Mark II back out, and um, the night mode got way better. <laughs> uh, there is a weird separation. My problem with other reviewers is they get a phone like the Xperia, and they know I'm only going to get very limited traffic. I'm going to put out like just one kind of all-encompassing review where I tell you it's not really worth it to buy, but it's some good ideas, and if you like Sony, you should probably pick one up. There is, There has always been, from the earliest days of using the Z series Xperia's, Sony camera apps are crazy unfamiliar. If you're used to picking up an iPhone you will not get good shots out of an Xperia playing with one for a couple hours. It doesn't grok the same. It is a different experience. And this generation with the Xperia 1, and I imagine it's going to be similar on the Xperia 5, having three separate Sony camera apps will complicate the learning curve. So what I do... I'm, what I'm doing on the Xperia 1. Uh, Photo Pro is the main photography app that I use. Cinema Pro is the main video app that I use. And then I use the Sony Xperia camera app in ultra low light auto mode because that's the only place where I can get night mode. So if I really want that, that crispy night image in, on a JPEG, that's really the only time I open the Sony uh, the Xperia camera app. Everything else is Photo Pro. And Photo Pro in P mode is so easy to use. Again, it's like I've got all these people that are complaining about how unintuitive uh, the camera app is, and they're shooting those videos on Sony Alphas. So if you figured out how to shoot a video on a Sony Alpha and you got that video uploaded to YouTube, what is stopping you from using this camera app, which is laid out almost exactly like a Sony Alpha. How is this difficult or not as good? This auto mode is flipping phenomenal and still gives you crazy awesome control. So you know, like, this is full auto. It's making all of the decisions for my exposure and my white balance, my shutter speed. And I can just come right up here and go like, ah, but I want it to be darker. Done! Push the button. Get pretty photo. Like, that's it. I just showed you auto mode. This is auto. <laughs> I, I, again, 
I feel like you have to be really bad at tech. I feel like you have to be really bad at camera-ing if you can't get a good shot out of an Xperia. These new sensors, awesome. It's very similar to the main uh, shooter that's in a Galaxy. And you don't hear people complaining about that. Color science on Sony, I like way better. The burst mode is insane. Um, the 20 frame per second full resolution JPEG burst mode. I'm now finally getting to look at some of the raw files and they're surprising, not, not surprisingly, they're startlingly good. I'm getting raw files out of a phone that look like finished JPEGs from two years ago. I, I, I don't see what the issue is, but I will admit if you just picked this phone up and you used it for a day, and then you spent two days shooting pretty B-roll of the phone, and then you took a day to write up an editorial that was largely focused on the specs, and then you published that as a review, you will get terrible output from a Sony camera because you did not live with it to really get a feel for what it does well and how it performs. Um, so that's where I'm critically excited about an Xperia 5. You know, it, it, it's still going to be expensive. I, we're rumoring, what, $950? Um, so it is going to be uh, a pricey. You know, there is a Sony tax, very similar to an Apple tax. But I'm, I, am, I am crazy lit up to see what that 4K video mode might be able to accomplish. <laughs> but the front, the front camera on a Sony blows. It's not great. Um, you can totally see where it's like a bunch of Sony engineers went like, well, we don't have selfie cameras on alphas. If you take a photo of yourself, take a photo of yourself with a good camera. And, and like the practice on that, I, I did this before, but here, let's do it again. So I've got my, my, my photo pro app. I'm just going to turn the phone around and, oh wait, do I have it on? Oh yeah. Autofocus continuous. Yeah, that was fine. And let me just kind of line this up here. And let's see, and yeah, and this looks great. So why would, why would I take a photo with the bad camera when it's really easy to take a good photo with the good camera? I, you know, I understand why we, we talk about selfie cameras or we, we have this like, you know, lowest common denominator consumer concern. Who is recommending a $950 camera focused specialty content creator device to people just trying to cover the lowest level of smartphone use. So yeah, there are gonna be some compromises. The selfie camera is fine for video calls and that's about where it should live. The rear camera is stupid good. So if I really care about trying to preserve my family memories. And, and, you know, if you get like a clear case, this is all mirror finish. <laughs> Lining up your shot is really easy. And, you know, especially like in the reflection of this, like, you know, bender visor right here on the back of the phone, you can see what you're composing <laughs> when you turn the phone around. And it's got a dedicated shutter button. So, you know, like you hold it out and you, you, you hit it with your pinky and boom, way better selfie than any other phone's mediocre front facing webcam. So Sony is going to ask a compromise of you to not have the absolute bestest selfie camera. I can totally see where that is going to upset some people. Those are not the people that I would say should be considering picking up a Sony you pick up a Sony because you might actually want to make something with a phone. I like making things with phones and not having to use a phone and then also use a computer and other things to complete that project. You know, I, when I travel to trade shows, I don't take my camera and laptop anymore. I do it on the phone. Now, to be fair, when I'm hired by Newegg, they tackle <laughs> all the other like editing and back end. Um, but me, it's what I cover is now phone. <laughs> Saeed, I'm going to go watch that audio review. Thanks, Juan. Thanks for bringing it up, Ted. Um, 
Uh, at DTNL, wait, that is full auto, all those controls on screen in full auto. You have to understand how cameras work. So P mode is, is a full auto where you still have the control to dial in specific um, lighting conditions. And on a proper camera, again, reviewers who shoot their reviews on Sony using Sony alphas don't seem to have any issues with this being not as intuitive and eh, just familiar. But basically you go and you say like, hey, this is what the phone is automatically exposing for and I wanna make it a little brighter. And you go boop and it makes it a little brighter. You go, hey, I want it to be a little darker. But what you might also care about are things like point focus or full auto. So you can kind of come in here into your autofocus and you can say, hey, I want you to take over everything. And so you'll see these little, these little squares from your autofocus going, but you might want the control to say, hey, I want you to just give me one little spot. So I'm just gonna, all right, come on, did I do that right? Oh, it's because I'm still pushing the button. <laughs> But you, know, you tap where you want it and then it focuses in on that specific spot. You can go in and alter other things like white balance, but in P mode, the phone will take care of all of that thinking for you and all you have to do is say brighter or darker. And I don't see where that's any grand concern. I mean, if you want, there is a full green box mode. So it still shows you everything in the camera interface, but I mean, it literally does everything but i've made this point and i'm going to continue to make this point if you care about content composition making a better image if you want to get some better use out of your phone um switch it over into p mode let the phone do 90 percent of the thinking for you and then all you need to do is fire up just a quick adjustment just if you want something to be a little bit darker or a little bit brighter. Because for me, I'm, I'm always, I'm almost always shooting a third stop under because I think smartphones overexpose. And then I do that and I push the shutter button and the images come out pretty and I'm fine. And like I said, I really do like Sony's post-processing. Their color science, they're not too aggressive or aggro with the sharpening and the structure. The vibrance is, is is uh, meaty without being unicorn puke. I, I mean, like, it's really hard, in my opinion, to objectively best a Sony camera when you're comparing it, you know, sort of point for point or spec for spec. The images that you get out of there are the most camera-like that you can get out of a smartphone. Whether that appeals to you or if you just want Instagram unicorn puke, that's up to you. <laughs> Vazicos 8 burst mode in RAW is missing. That is absolutely true. Um, I don't know of any. Is there any? It's not on a Samsung. It's not on an LG. In fact, I'm really struggling to think what phone really does keep up with the 20 frame per second burst in JPEG. And I don't think anyone does. Let alone, I don't believe there's any rapid fire raw on any other phone. <laughs> and did you know, Juan be rocking them old school selfies. Like I had a mirror on the back of my Apache. What was that? The PPC 6700. Um, so I've been doing rear camera selfies since the beginning. Oh, and the rack focus on the Xperia's. You just point set up two focus points and the phone does the focus pull for you. Again, you want to know um, if you want to make something, if you want to do something on a phone, like, guys, I'm telling you, there are other options and stuff. Uh, Steve, Q3 Becker, P mode means program. That is correct. It is called the program mode. Um <laughs> programmable i've always i mean especially on canon i think i've always just abbreviated that program mode but we call it p mode i still i mean i make fun of green box mode you could still shoot full full auto in the in the pro app i just feel if you're going full full auto you might as well let the phone decide for you on hdr and night mode and that's where the xperia camera app actually does pretty well I'm telling you, the night mode photos are everything that I like about LG, but but better processed. It's not day for night or night for day. 
It doesn't turn your night mode shots into daytime like a OnePlus tries to do. It's night, but with extreme clarity and the lowest possible noise. And it does it phenomenally well. So you get these really dark images that are just so clean. Um, it's really good. I don't like that it's a full auto though. That's one thing I wish. I mean, like, I wish I could just have Photo Pro and then have a night mode that I specifically engage, but it's like an iPhone. You know, the, the iPhone doesn't give you the option of enabling night mode. If it detects there's too much light, bumps you out of night mode. Um, I, the, I If I were going to critique, I'd want to see um, an Xperia that does like what LG or what Samsung or Google um, OnePlus Nightscape. Is it Nightscape on a OnePlus? But you specifically enable it. And then you know you're shooting night mode. I, I, I don't like full auto but if you're going green box mode in photo pro i would recommend just switch over to the xperia camera and then you get the benefit of the juicier social media hdr processing it's a little bit more vibrant it's a it's a little bit more fun but photo pro i really like the look of images out of photo pro <laughs> matt tyler so you're saying sony has a pro mode that's good and the main focus of the phone is pro mode. Who knew? <laughs> um, from Artin, Artin Bakan, what do you think about Pixel cameras? Um, I've got my Pixel 4 right here on my Pixel 4a. My Pixel 4 is over on the over on the, the table behind me. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, I think Pixel 4a has the best average consumer HDR stills. Like if what you care about is pushing shutter button and getting the juiciest, brightest, most colorful, vibrant images you can, um, I still think Google is the company to beat. Um, their video is very good. The UHD video on a Pixel 4a is very good. And the stabilization is shockingly smooth for a $350 phone. But I would give Apple maybe a slight nod for the auto exposure in in UHD 60 frame per second video. Again, I, I think they trade blows really well. If you're really trying to boil it down to, I shouldn't have to do anything but push a shutter button and get a pretty image, and you don't you don't have specific concerns for your composition or what the the look of the image should be, then it's Pixel 4a all day. I really think it's it's the the option to beat. <laughs> Matt Tyler, Rapid Raw is on a Poco. God wants Sony or rubbish. <laughs> um, Fat Produce, I firmly believe that mid to low range phones should have raw capture in order to help users get every bit out of their cameras as they can if there are sacrifices in hardware and image processing at those price points. And what's kind of interesting though, is like the sacrifices we're talking about largely just put us in line with flagship cameras from two years ago. You know, a Pixel 4a camera feels a lot like a Pixel 4 uh, full price premium camera. It gets you really close to that experience. The hardware is exceedingly similar after a certain tier below that, I, I feel like you're in for kind of a the same experience from phone to phone to phone. You know, the optics are very similar. The hardware is very similar. Your depth of field is very similar. Uh, the expectations on shutter speed. Uh, if you're capturing a RAW file, you don't get the benefit of multiple stacked exposures. So you don't have that pretty HDR processing. Like all those things kind of line up. Um, the, the difference has become a bit more granular in just what kind of post you enjoy. You know, if the, the HDR is a little bit easier to use, you don't have to hold your hand as still for as long. It's that kind of stuff. It's, it, it's more nuanced than just iPhones have the best cameras. Hems don't. No, they don't. <laughs> and Matt Tyler, G cam. It's not the sensor on your phone. It's the processing after the fact. And from Saeed, Sony, out of character, has put a ton of promo vids out on the 5 Mark II. The wind noise filter looks great. I, again, I, I so want to play with what the 5 Mark II can do. And I really want to compare it against the 1. 
the one mark two has just been such a joy to come back to and like again i just go out and my daughter's on a push bike and she's running around a parking lot and i just hold down the button and it goes crack and like there are 20 shots of her clearing the frame and they're focus perfect and it's just so pretty i love it so much yeah, from Matt Tyler, LG and Sony are both upping their marketing game, which is good. Because again, I kind of feel like if you don't lead the conversation on your products, then you let, let YouTubers just go, it's not as good a camera. This is a, I mean, how many like, I mean, like techie phone reviews you see? Like, well, Sony's really trying to say like, this is a camera focused smartphone, but the cameras are like so difficult to use. And then you go and you look at like a photographer's channel and yeah, pros and cons, but they're like, yeah, no, I like this. And oh, look at this menu. And it looks just like my alpha. And it's so it's so accessible. And this is how I like to use it. And isn't it nice having a shutter button on a phone so you can use it like a camera? The camera dude's way more on point for talking about what the phone does well. But techies are like, well, it doesn't have like the same HD. I had to use like two different apps and like uh, no consumer should like ever have to use different apps because it should just work. <laughs> again, it's like, again, if you can't, if you really can't, and, and, I, and I mean this, and, and I mean this, you know, from, from the bottom of my heart, if you can't get good photos out of an Xperia, I mean, you're really bad at tech. And, and I feel for you. I feel, I feel bad for you. I, I really do. Because you're missing out. You're missing out on a unique, different, and differentiating experience that's not like other phones. And that's good. We shouldn't be paying lip service to competition and then complaining about how competition might feel different from the videos that make us the most money. But I digress. <laughs> Uh, a DTNL sassy one is someone I'd like to avoid. <laughs> Vazikos8, the art of photography uh, guy on YouTube. He is good. I do like his channel. Um, Saeed, Sony promo needs to hype the Xperia Pro now. I'm curious on a phone marrying a professional workflow. Uh, how about we just get through the Xperia 5 so that it's actually in more people's hands? And then we can start talking about an Xperia Pro. <laughs> um, McCorcoran 3, was the Xperia poorly reviewed? It, it wasn't. But if I go through sort of the backlog of Xperia 1 videos from techies, it's a lot of the same dog whistling. You know, like, oh, I guess if you want to use these types of cinema camera apps on a phone, you can. You know, it's that kind of thing that really bothers me where... You can watch a video from a certain type of, of influencer, and they're mostly saying positive things, but they're saying them in critical ways. So like on the surface, it's like, oh, well, this is a good idea. But the overall tone is still, shouldn't buy this phone. And, and that to me becomes extremely problematic. You know, it's an implied comparison where the winner, and they might not even mention Samsung or Apple or a popular manufacturer, but the implied comparison is, this phone loses to someone else in the market. And the Xperia 1, I think, suffered from a lot of that. You know, you, you bring up, like, this is the most pixel-dense display on an OLED on the market today. And, you know, like, the 90 hertz approximation with the black frame insertion, it's not as good as a real 90 hertz or 120 hertz display. But setting this to the absolute smallest pixel pitch and font size I'm telling you, my eyes can see a difference, and I like using the tiniest possible font. So you get that, like, well, I guess if you're wanting to watch movies from your phone that this is a good screen to do it on. And you're like, yeah, that's kind of the point of the phone. It's a differentiating feature that doesn't perform like every other phone. And that's the thing that kind of bothers me about that tone of commentary is on the surface, it's mostly a positive examination. But when you really listen to the conclusions or how they bring up pros and cons, if a device is different, it kind of becomes the loser. 
in an implied comparison against a product which is going to be more broadly accepted. I can count on more people owning Samsung and owning Apple. So those devices are worth it. Objectively, they never get sort of a qualified buy or don't buy. As brands, they sort of just get the default purchase recommendation. And so then what does a Sony really do to justify its price? And we don't talk about iPhones in the same way. We don't talk about iPhones in the same, Apple needs to defend their existence to sell phones. What justifies the price of a $1,000 64 gig iPhone 11 Pro? We take a lot of that for granted and then point out some of, I mean, yeah, it's a pricey phone and you probably do want to step up to a larger storage because 64 gig is ludicrously lean on a phone that expensive. And if you need to, you can go down to an iPhone 11. You're like, no problems explaining the ecosystem of Apple and all of the little nuances, but on a Sony or on a Surface, defend your existence because this has a Snapdragon 855. So I'm going to ignore two whole screens and each screen is thinner than the camera bulge on a Galaxy Note and it has stylus support with great spanning. And there are a few little software bugs and the camera is kind of mediocre. It's a very good selfie camera, but we've just established that selfie cameras are kind of lame. But I'm going to ignore all of the things that does, this does right and now Microsoft needs to justify why they exist. And you're like, well, but then you didn't use it. Because <laughs> if you used it, it makes an argument for why it exists. Can you explain that argument? Because I can. I don't think it's that precious. I don't think it's that difficult to explain. So I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to pick on on you, uh, Michael. Um, it, it's it, it to me. It's it's frustrating because it allows a reviewer or an influencer to hide. You know, oh, well, I said a lot of great things about LG. Yeah, in videos where you sort of explicitly state how no one should buy LG. You're not finding the right consumer for the right product. You're looking at what's the most popular and what's likely going to be um, the, 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 you know, it's more statistically likely that someone's going to come to your channel owning a Samsung or an iPhone. And so you're making videos for them. You're not making videos to really detail like, this is what my experience was. This is who I think would be a good fit for an LG or a Duo or a OnePlus or, or a Motorola or a, a Sony. You're using them as an implied comparison point so that Samsung and Apple can win because it's more likely someone will watch that video owning a Samsung or an Apple. So you can, you can say all the nice things, but if you're not really living up to a standard of competition, then I, I find that commentary to be reductive. <laughs> yeah, some, some, some fun commentary. I'm sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat because I went off on another soapbox and we should end this because I was really not planning on making this a uh, two and a half hour podcast. Uh. From Dave Burns, I don't. I think phone reviewers don't acknowledge that niches exist, and and it and that like it's okay. It's okay for. I mean, like seriously, we're getting to that point. Like, I want to write in the comments for people that have enjoyed using the Duo. Like, it's okay that you like your phone. Yeah. No one is suggesting that this phone is going to be a top seller, but. If we don't get things like this, then phones stay the same. And it's insufficient to say that only Samsung is allowed to try out new form, form factors. That is not okay. I do not want Samsung to be the only company that can try. <laughs> All right, let, let's wrap this up. Let me get this out of the way here. 
<laughs> Kyle Ruggles, go for another hour. Now nah, my voice can't handle it. I'm, I'm, I'm getting real close. But, you know, again, I drained all of the delicious fluid in this coffee mug right here. Um, you will not be more directly connected or better connected to the highest fidelity of your beverage without a headphone jack coffee mug. Uh, this is an endangered species that a company like Sony is bringing back. I'm a little concerned about the LG Wing losing the headphone jack, but I can plug microphones into this as well as I can plug headphones. So Xperia 1 Mark II, uh, if you care about your ears, you'd probably appreciate having options for both wired and wireless audio playback. So on that note, let's wrap this up. Uh, folks, thank you so much for joining on a cranky, salty, ranty video <laughs> podcast as always. Um, this is... Uh, this is um, my, my weekly refuel. I very much appreciate those of you who go with me on this, this ride. A couple stories we absolutely need to keep track of that are happening in the world of tech, especially tech and politics. And it, we need to be okay talking about how tech and lifestyle and politics in, 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 entwine, they intermingle. So uh, thank you so much for, for that support, for that continued conversation, for those of you who share. I'm serious. I'm very serious when I say that the, the business of making these videos is probably unsustainable. And I'm very likely on the losing end of this kind of conversation where at some point I'll need to re-examine, reassess, and pivot. Because I'll tell you, for a channel that still regularly picks up like 2,000 new subscribers, two to 3,000 new subscribers every month, my views plummet. My views crater when I don't just make Samsung Apple videos all the time. So uh, that's not going to be something I can keep doing. You know, if it means just putting everything under Patreon, that might need to be the uh, adjustment that we make to continue this commentary or you just leave. And, you know, maybe I go and work for, you know, a company's PR or something like that. I don't know. Maybe LG's hiring. I've said some nice things about them in the past. So those of you here, and I'm largely preaching to the choir, um, those of you who join me on these kinds of chats, it, it's noticed. I, I can't always say thank you individually to everyone who shares and everyone who supports and everyone who legitimately participates. But if you appreciate a, a style of commentary and you're active, those content creators notice. And, and it, it is wonderfully appreciated. Again, words are insufficient to express that kind of gratitude. So I'm glad that you're along for this ride. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to future conversations with this crew and with this audience. And uh, you're doing good work as much as I'm trying to put out some fun conversations and some fun commentary. So I want you to have an amazing week with your technology. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I want to see every one of these voices back here for another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be safe. Take care. The world is still plenty crazy out there. So uh, don't, don't, don't go doing dumb stuff. Come on back. Let's have another chat. I think it'll be good for all of us. Take care. Be well. I'll catch you back.